if I wasn't sure if I was prepared for this enough or not, it already started with Mike screwing up my name. <laughs> That's been happening since I was about, you know, five years old when somebody said, well, Damien Buchman, please come to the principal's <laughs> office. It's actually Damien Bookman. But I'm going to start today with uh, some words. And the first one is going to be freshmen. Do I have any freshmen in the room right now? Beautiful. So some of you might relate to this, but probably not. So I actually <laughs> attended UWM, right? I didn't so much go as much as I did just enroll for three semesters, but I was a student a year back in 1997. Day one, moment one at UWM. I actually was over at Enderus Hall looking to park, right? Uh, and if you're familiar with that area, there seems to be what I thought was an exceptionally wide sidewalk, and I decided to just drive my car right up on that sidewalk as another entrance that I thought was to the parking lot, and ended up doing a UE in the little uh, grass plot there, right over the curb and into the parking lot. That was day one, moment one. Embarrassed just a little bit as people watch me drive past them, like, what is this man doing? <laughs> yeah. Day one, I don't belong. It didn't stop there though, right? We all have these backpacks that we use. Most of these backpacks have these water bottle things on the side, right? Well, I bought myself an orange juice in the morning. Not so much in a water bottle as much as it was in a cup. And I decided to pick something up off the floor and that orange juice right there, oh yeah, it just came coming streaming right down my back while a couple of nice ladies were right behind me. Day one, moment two. So maybe you can see why I didn't go to any more classes across three semesters, but the first few in the first couple of days. So freshmen, I hope you haven't experienced that. I doubt anybody has a worse story, but if you do, you come and talk to me so maybe my nightmare can end every time <laughs> I visit this campus. So we talked a little bit about words, right? And this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a little word association today. This isn't so much for um, you as it is for me, so that I remember what I need to talk to you guys about as my AD kicks in. But in case you're flipping through your social media right now and you need to get back in, you're going to know where we're at and you're going to be able to follow along. First word, cancer. Does everybody feel warm and fuzzy inside, really positive and good, that word cancer, right? What is it? It's the disease caused by an uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells that destroy body tissue. Positivity makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. But I'm no doctor, I'm no expert, so we're not going to get into the science of this. More importantly, when it comes to cancer, I survived it. Twice. See, when I was 13 years old, just three days before my 13th birthday, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I don't know what you guys were doing in seventh grade at that time, but my only concern was whether or not I had enough product in my hair, if my mullet was on point, and if I was going to see my girlfriend before class. That's all I was worried about. The last thing I was thinking about was um, hospital stays, chemotherapy, losing my hair, throwing up, surgery. These weren't the things I was thinking about. But three days before my 13th birthday, that became my reality. Today, I am standing in front of you as a one in a billion survivor, statistically, of my diagnosis. From Children's Hospital here in Wisconsin to Sloan Kettering Memorial Cancer Hospital in New York, physicians told my mom that I would die. Take him home, mom. It's going to be an ugly death. Buck up. Your son's not going to make it. Now, I didn't know that reality necessarily. I always thought I had at least a 10% chance of living, and a 10% chance was better than none. But I survived. Disability, another one of those warm and fuzzy words, right? We've been talking a little bit about it today in different capacities, but I'm going to reframe it a little bit for you today. We're going to go ahead and take the dis out of disability, right? Because here's my philosophical thought on disability. Ability is just a noun that is a talent, skill, or proficiency in a particular area, right? So when you think about disability, somebody who's a daily wheelchair user certainly is going to be more proficient at using that wheelchair than you are if you get in one for the first time. So are you a disabled wheelchair user? Right? I had a god-awful voice. I'm not going to sing for you right now. Does that mean that my voice is disabled? Am I a disabled singer? It's just not what I'm proficient in. It's just not my skill. So maybe there really isn't disability at all if we think about that. 
in a philosophical manner. Now let me tell you, I'm not one of these guys that's into that handicapable thing, you know, that differently able thing, the politically correct words, it's not my MO. But in reality, maybe we're either all just able or maybe we're all disabled. Tabs. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, but first of all, here's the thing. They tell you that if you're feeling a little bit nervous during a talk, that you should picture the audience naked. And I've got two problems with that. Number one, I can't really see you because of this bright light. And number two, it just doesn't seem morally right. So if you guys are okay, I think I'm just going to go ahead and take my pants off right now. Yeah. Because I just need, I need to get, you know, I need to get a little more comfortable myself. I feel good about this, I hope you guys do, <laughs> as I begin to fall over. So TABS, what is it? It's an acronym that stands for Temporarily Able-Bodied, which now starts to make sense as to why I took my pants off. See, you may not notice, but I have big scars on my legs from my cancer. You can probably see here a little bit in the front row that this is where the cancer just went ahead and ate some of my bone in my muscle. And in my left leg, they decided to put a muscle right here that I can flex that doesn't even belong there, right? And internally, I'm nothing but metal and plastic basically from my hips to my ankles. So TABS, temporarily able-bodied. It's important to understand that this is the one demographic that we all belong to, right? We are not going to wake up tomorrow if you are a man and understand the plight of a woman. And if you are Caucasian, you are not going to wake up tomorrow and understand the plight of an African American in America. But you may someday, because of disease or accident or old age, you will understand what it's like to be temporarily able-bodied. I learned that at 13 years old. I went from one minute being almost an elite athlete in my school district to the next minute being in a neobomalizer and crutches. I went from one minute being able to the next minute having an ambulatory disability from, since I was 13. I've had 22 knee replacements and revisions, 32 surgeries since I was 13. It's amazing that I'm even standing here on my own two legs now because of almost all of my friends who had osteosarcoma who are amputees are not amputees from the cancer itself, but they're amputees from infection post-surgery. I've had 32 surgeries, one infection, still standing on my own two feet. I understand what temporarily able body means, and I learned it at a young age. So if anybody took any pictures, <laughs> please go ahead and hashtag those for me, a little bit of hashtag man drops pants, hashtag peekaboo, and hashtag not so much viral video as much as hashtag 14 inches. <laughs> my scars, my scars, they're 14 inches long on each leg. Yeah, so just go ahead, hashtag that for me, maybe we'll get a viral video. <laughs> so if you can't tell, I've been through a lot in my life already, right? Since I was 13 years old, I'm 37 now. And I, I've always had this need to honor my survivorship. Sometimes I talk about this idea of maybe I'm living a cat's life. Nine lives. I've spent four so far. When I was six months old, I was failure to thrive. When I was two years old, the doctors told my mom he's probably not going to make it through the night as I was changing colors and I had a 105, 106 degree temperature and I was laying on a, a bed of ice. 13 diagnosed with cancer. 14 freshman year again, one month in. God, I hate freshman years. I was re-diagnosed with cancer, right? This time in my left leg. And so I've always wanted to give back and I always asked how. Six years ago, I discovered that. I discovered what I would do to give back. I always thought it was going to be kids with cancer, but I learned that, that cancer often causes disability. And I'm an athletic person. I enjoy athletics. I enjoy fitness. I enjoy you know, working out and those things from time to time. So I asked, what if adults and children with disabilities had access to a fitness center, an athletic facility designed and equipped and built just for them, but inclusive of the able-bodied public? Seems to make like a lot of sense, right? So I was given this vision. I believe I've been chosen to deliver this, the Ability Center, that that's my plan on this earth and this time. And the vision is to build a self-sustaining, universally designed recreation center that deploys reverse inclusion. Sounds like a lot going on, but we'll soon understand that it's amazing that we're only talking about this now and that this wasn't done 20 plus years ago. There it is. Three years ago, I was lucky enough to run into an architect who decided to do some work for me and help me out. 
He took my head and translated it onto paper. This is a $50 million vision, 230,000 square foot fitness and athletic center. There's nothing else like it in the US. People have told me countless times, this is impossible. This is not gonna happen. You can't realize this. Well, let me tell you what. It's the same thing my doctors told my mom when I was 14 years old, that I wouldn't survive. Impossible doesn't exist in my vocabulary. I'm unwilling to stop, hence this unstoppable concept, until I walk through these doors of the Ability Center. So what's reverse inclusion? What is that in that? I think it's so important. It's this concept that's inside my head that talks about building a disabled world where the able-bodied public is included, and we're asking them to live in our world. We heard earlier today about the concept of deaf gain. These things simply make sense. An accessible world works for everybody, right? Some of you may be familiar with the project that we did in conjunction a little bit with UW-Milwaukee and one of your OT students here called Ramp Up MKE at Bradford Beach, where we opened the beach for a day. We made it accessible for the day. We built an inclusive world for people with disabilities, and it also worked for the able-bodied public where people with strollers or big coolers or on bikes or skateboards actually just rode head down that ramp and onto the beach. It works for everybody. For those of you who don't know, we just celebrated this year the 25th anniversary of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, an extremely important piece of legislation that opened the world for more people with disabilities and created inclusion. But at the Ability Center and myself, I don't believe it's gone far enough. You see, still to this day, according to the CDC, it is not the disability that's the problem itself. It's the secondary conditions of heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. This is a problem that can be solved. This is what something like the Ability Center does. It's not just about being a nonprofit and serving people. It's about solving problems. And if we're not living a sedentary lifestyle and we're able to access things, then we can go ahead and solve that problem, right? So the ADA, while it's done great things, it hasn't gone far enough. We believe there needs, there's a lot more to do. And it talks about access in the ADA. And that's about it to me. That was step one. They left out this really other important word, opportunity, right? So access is about being able to get through those doors and come into this room. But you may notice there were only a few opportunities of where people in wheelchairs could sit. So we're not thinking in a space of how much opportunity are we actually providing for these individuals. And remember, you could be that individual at any given moment in any given time. What opportunities are we providing for them inside of our spaces? That's what the Ability Center looks like. Let me tell you what it's like to be a person with a disability and a member in a fitness gym or athletic facility. It's as if you were going to a restaurant you order a plate of food, let's say burgers and fries, you get two fries, you eat those, they take the rest of your plate away and you still pay 100% of your bill. <laughs> that makes sense? That's what it's like. Because one to 5% of equipment is accessible in a fitness center for people with disabilities. But I can't go ahead and write a 97 cent check to the uh, Wisconsin Athletic Club, send it in and say, there's my 1% fee, are you guys cool with that? Am I still a member in your facility? They're not gonna be okay with that even though that's all they provide me. So there's no value there. So when we think about this, we need to take it a step up, and we need to go beyond access and just being able to enter through doors or get into the building and try to discuss and look at what's the actual opportunity. This has been a dream of mine for the last six years. This ability center. This space where we can actually reframe the way we look at access, opportunity, fitness, athletics for the entire country. And it can happen right here in our own backyard. And when you chase your dreams, there's one thing that you always have to focus on, and that's passion. And I gotta tell you that when you're chasing your dreams, passion is just about the only currency you have. People are magnified, magnetized to passion. To date so far, the Ability Center has raised about a half a million dollars through the currency of passion, but about a million dollars in in-kind work from the community for people who want to get behind it. Because I followed my dreams. Because I'm following my dreams. 
because I have an amazing wife who allows me to work for free and follow my dreams. Any women in here, would you allow your husbands to work for free? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Uh, and she gets it. And she loves the passion that I deliver on a daily basis to help make a difference. And she actually works with some of my old doctors right here at Children's Hospital. And she comes home and she reminds me constantly of things about the fact that I'm alive and how important that is. And one of my doctors to her one day in a care conference said, this is 17 laters post my treatment, Bo, your husband is the reason that we try so hard. It's incredible. And at one of my appointments, a doctor said to me, Damien, I remember when your ticket came in and your plane never took off. Now, if that doesn't make you chase and follow your dreams with a sense of passion, I don't know what does. And the last thing you're going to need is perseverance if you decide to chase your dreams. The perseverance is a steadfastness in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. They tell you that it takes about 10 years to get anything significant done. For those of you at UWM, you might be familiar uh, with Innovation Campus out on Watertown Plank in Wauwatosa. That took 10 years. Discovery World took 10 years. I don't care if the Ability Center takes 20. I'm not stopping till I walk through those doors. Perseverance is something you're always going to have to have, despite the haters, despite anybody who tells you that this is impossible, despite anybody that tells you that your dreams are not going to happen. Perseverance is your only personal form of currency. So don't ever quit. Always be unstoppable. Don't ever give up. Finally, here's the thing that's beautiful. When you're living your purpose, as I believe I am with the Ability Center, when you are living your purpose, miracles are yours for the tripping over. Daily. Almost every moment. Momentarily. But the trick is that they're not always about somebody who's in a chair standing up and walking or somebody who's blind seeing. Sometimes those miracles are nothing more than the fact that I'm standing here in front of you on my own two feet, alive, well, Sometimes it's a song that's played on the radio that picks you up. Think about the millions of songs that could be played at any given time. And that song is motivating you at that moment that you may need it. That is a miracle. So can you open your mind and your heart and your soul enough to allow those in? That's the trick. That's the trick. I will leave you with two challenges today. Number one. Anybody out there can figure out how I can get my pants back on during this conversation? I'd really appreciate it. Meet me at stage right, and I would love to hear how I figure that piece of this out. But number two is to react differently to people with disabilities. Because remember, there is one demographic that every one of us in this room belong to, and that's TABS. Temporarily able-bodied. Disease, accident, old age some level of disability is absolutely positively inescapable. Thank you.